systems. So really it's about the work we have done, are doing, and will do in this. So the agenda is going to be just a very quick refresher on the programming model and the architecture and how it actually fits onto the NIC. Then I'm going to give a brief two minutes on quickly on the performance we're seeing today and the optimizations we're going to be doing in the future. That's just to give you an idea of kind of how this fits together. And then beyond that, we're actually going to go on to the stuff we really need to do to be able to use this in production. And that's mainly what Jakob will be covering. So the programming model, and this has actually changed very recently slightly, and Jakob will go through those changes. But for now, this is the model as was. So really, you, you compile your programs, you run your programs as you would do if it was not offloaded. And everything runs as per normal until you get down to the verifier. Once you get down to the verifier, we um, run it as normal and then go down into the driver where we can detect if you actually want to offload the program. So this is done via IP root or if you're using CLS BPF, you, uh, you can do it via TC. And at that point, we then rerun the verifier and have a few extra checks which we use for the, um, for the JIT and for the actual offload. So there are a few things like, for example, if you've got a ty map type we don't yet support, in which case we won't actually offload the program and then you just run it in the driver as per normal. So really, it's the idea is to give you the offload if you want it and not if you don't. Next one. So this is just, and I apologize, it seems that our slides are cutting off at the side. But what this is about is this is to show um, just how it fits onto the actual NIC. So you've got your 10 BPF registers. They go into the, our general purpose registers. We have about 64 of those per thread. And you've got 60 cores on the device. So and four threads per core running. So there's actually eight threads, but we only use four for our BPF offload at the moment. And then you put the stack into the local memory where we have about a kilobyte per thread on each core. And then at the moment, the maps of all sizes go down actually into DRAM. So we have about two gig of DRAM there. We can actually hold up to eight gig of DRAM there on the, on the, on the NIC if we want to through the chip. And we have a bunch of other memories which we don't actually use at this point in time, but they become important later on. Uh, so this is just to give you a quick example of performance we're seeing. Uh, so I quickly hacked up a simple XDP load balancer. It came to about 800 BPF instructions, and there were four lookups. Um, it's based on the TC example in the kernel, which you can find in self-test BPF L4L, um, L4LB.C. And then I just combined it with the IP tunneling from XDP TX IP tunnel uh, to create a sim very simple load balancer. Um, it's, you know, it's not optimized, big health warning, this is not perfect. Um, the one change I had to make to offload it was there's a per CPU array for the stats. I had to change that to a standard array because we don't quite hold the, um, the actual per CPU system. It doesn't really make sense for us at the moment. We would have to put a small map in e every single um, core, which would be uh, unideal at this point in time. So we can do that in the future, but at the moment that's not something we're doing. So. Uh, I ran it as is today with the offload as we have it in our POC at the moment. And we got to about 24 million packets per second. In the driver, it ran at about 21 million packets per second, which was about 2.6 million packets per second per core. Uh, so you can, you're getting a lot from the offload. And then what I did was a few of the maps are quite small. So at the moment, as you saw from the first slide, we put all the maps into DRAM. Now, if you actually take the smaller maps and you put them higher up, so you use the um, memories which are much closer to the cores, then we were getting this running up to about 42, 43 million packets per second. It's just a rough number. It's just to give you an idea of where we stand today. Um, and there's still a lot of optimization left to do. So at the moment, the map placements can be improved. I put caching there, but really, you can't really use caching if you're doing things like DOS. So it's really about the placement. Um, and then what I've called the packet cacher is we effectively, we actually have a store of the packet on the core in each thread as it's running, but we're not actually using that today. Today, when any packet access we do, we're actually going to a piece of memory, which is on the island, which is about 50 cycles away, even though we actually have a packet sitting three cycles away. Now, that's because it was easier to do and it was um, quick to get done. Now, that's an optimization we have in the future. And Jiang, who's in the audience, has been doing a lot of work on 32-bit uh, ALUs for LLVM. And that, obviously, then also is significantly better when you have a 32-bit architecture like we have because it massively reduces the amount of instructions you're actually using. Uh, and finally, there's some firmware locks which we can get rid of. But the important thing and what we really want to focus on today and what we want to focus on in this talk is about how we get ready to use this in production. 
how you can use this and how you can feel safe and comfortable when you're running it in a you know in a massive massive data center so the first thing we have is and that's all briefly touch on is multi-stage processing but we've called it here but what that really means is that there could be situations where you've got a huge chunk of BPF programs running and you don't want to run all of them in the offload mode. You actually want to offload some of them and run some of them in the driver. That could be for a variety of reasons. You could have new features which haven't been yet been implemented in the offload which are running in the, in the driver. There could be many other things going on like that. Um, or you could have, you know, you could have maps which are 20, 30 gig in size. I don't know, you could have some, something funny going on like that. So there's some reasons why you would want to run some of the programs locally and others remotely uh, or offload. And then obviously we'll talk about the debug work. And finally, um, we'll mention about the JIT architecture and the changes we've made, whereby the verifier now reruns um, m in a different place. So effectively, you rerun the verifier much earlier. That's before you have a lot of the optimization for the host architecture happening, which means it's much easier to offload and it means we can keep feature parity much quicker. Uh, so just quickly, I'll touch on the multi-stage processing before handling over. Uh, we can obviously, the edge case you run into here is what if you have tail calls which are going to different programs. So you have some programs leaving the NIC, having done, let's say, three or four BPF programs that want to then go to a, a particular other um, BPF program, whereas some of the other examples could tail call into a different BPF program. So you could use something like the, XDP, uh, the data meta fields, which Daniel Borkman added, to make sure that you actually go to the correct next program. It's, it's just a very simple thing which you need to be able to handle, I think, once you get to the stage of using this in, in significant, in anger, really. So I think that's pretty much it from me. At this stage, I'll hand over to Jacob, Jacob who will talk about most of, the, most of the real work we're doing. Thank you. Um, <coughs> so uh, updates, uh, we, we gave a presentation about the same subject a year ago. And I will go through the items and what we've been doing um, for the last year. So uh, things we changed upstream. Uh, there were some instructions that Daniel, Daniel added for comparisons. So he was nice enough to implement them for RGs as well. Uh, John has added a negation instruction. And I've added a byte swap and I think some others. So that just, uh, I think we are pretty much covering the basic instruction set for BPF, or at least what LLVM is using. Uh, we also added direct packet access, so um, which is the newer way of accessing packet data in eBPF, so based on, on packet pointers directly. So that's uh, supported. It required some verifier changes and uh, basically sparked uh, their decision to, to change our architecture slightly. I will talk about that in more in detail later. We also have full stack support, um, f all 512, uh, 500 bytes, I think, pretty much anything that the verifier will accept, we can offload. So unaligned accesses, um, yes, pretty much anything. Uh, I put the adjust head helper here. Uh, we don't have that upstream yet. I was hoping I would be able to post the patches during the week, but I wasn't. But that's already. Um, so we will be able to support adjust head perhaps in the next uh, merge window, but yeah, hopefully soon. Um, and uh, as Nick mentioned, Junk has added a uh, basic 32-bit uh, subregister support to LLVM and will be continuing uh, the work both in the kernel LLVM and basically all the tool, tool chains. Um, and there's a whole bunch of stuff that we have prototyped and in implemented internally m to test the performance and see where our bottlenecks are and also to just get a feel of how this stuff all fits together. And I don't think we will be upstreaming it w in the form that it is today because there's a lot of uh, sharp edges. But we do have map offload basically running, and Nick was showing the performance numbers for for the, the implementation. And we have uh, atomic operations as well, so the atomic add that the uh, eBPF can support. Um, we have other atomic operations, but the, well, we can expose them in the instruction set if people need them. But right, the, the chip uh, can can do more atomic operations than, than just add. Um, also, Nick mentioned the um, uh, optimization, so I don't yeah, I will talk about this in detail slightly because it would require some APIs, perhaps, to be added to the kernel. But we, the junk has started working on some optimization in our JIT, and those optimizations will probably become more and more complex. So the ones that we have right now is uh, we have some old that are very simple, which are already upstream. But uh, there are the, the, the latest one was the memcopy optimization. That's not yet posted upstream. But basically, uh, there's, there are no, no loops in BPF right now. 
So um, MEM copies are completely unrolled, and that's uh, that generates slightly unoptimal uh, I/O pattern for us. So Junk has added optimization to basically roll them back in into a single big I/O operation. Uh, and yes, the, the the work on register tracking basically is comes down to trying to make sure that if there's a 32-bit value in the kept by the register, we don't have to do 64-bit ALU operations on them. So save some uh, cycles and, and call space there. Um, uh, the bigger changes that we have contributed uh, are mostly about tooling. Obviously, when you start implementing a more complex project, you need to think about tooling. And uh, one of the first things that we needed is, uh, is a way of, of performing map operations in like a flexible and easy way. Um, if you look at the, the BPF samples that are in the kernel, they're most the b basically all BPF programs today have sort of two elements to them, the control plane and the data plane. So eBPF is the b b data plane, but there's also a control plane program that understands how the BPF program works and communicates with it through the maps. And that's 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 how it's usually deployed. But for testing purposes and for just introspection into seeing what's running on the system, it's useful to be able to just perform like single operations, like map updates and lookups uh, by hand from command line. So we added the BPF tool, and it's in the kernel tree, and will be in the 4.15 release. It's also on GitHub, but we will probably remove it from GitHub because the the in tree version is more up to date. Um, and it basically allows to list and uh, read information about all the obj BPF objects on the system. So all the stuff that uh, that the kernel exposes. This basically work uh, leverages the the work that Martin from Facebook did to expose all the BPF information and some of the old stuff that was already there in the file descriptor info and that gathers them in all in one place that that's easy for people to access. And it also allows the uh, dumping the jitted images, uh, the, the, the host jitted images, and just the BPF instructions and printing them. And as I said, the, all the map operations. Um, yes, and recently Quentin also added the uh, JSON output, which is extremely useful for us for testing, hopefully for other people as well. And there is some uh, BPF FS integration also that Quentin that did, and we had uh, patches from Prashant, Prashant lately, which is very nice to see someone else, uh, someone from outside the company contributing to the tool already. Um, so uh, another piece of uh, tooling that we really needed and have put upstream is the Junk's work on LLVM uh, machine code. That's basically an LLVM macro assembler. And uh, uh, we started writing the test. Basically, if writing a hardware translator, we have a need to test uh, particular BPF uh, snippets, like sequences of, of instructions. And uh, the way that the, the test infrastructure in the kernel does it today is basically they include the instructions inside the C program, and there are like a static array of instructions. But that's not great for testing and for adding tests, uh, the test cases. So we added the LLVM MC. So basically right now we can just write the BPF programs in the same format as the verifier uh, uses for uh, for logging the its uh, log output and uh, assemble that into elf uh, elf files and and load that directly. So that's really useful for us and uh, that also will be useful if someone wants to add uh, inline assembly to BPF C code in an LVM. We are probably not going to be too interested in this ourselves but it opens the way to, to implement that. Um. So now into the kernel, inf uh, kernel changes. Um, this is how the BPF uh, offload sort of worked uh, until recently. And uh, you can see on the left hand side is the BPF subsystem inf uh, inter interactions and on the right is, uh, is the networking stuff. And uh, one thing that I should point, point out from the start is that there is nothing, no lines crossing from the one to the other. So BPF programs are loaded and verified and basically prepared. And then there's another system call which is uh, attaching them to a specific place in the kernel. So when the user wants to load the program, the it everything is done by the BPF subsystem. But if we want to offload that program later for, for the network device, there is no no way for us to, to know that at the, at the time of the first verification and basically a lot of information is lost or, 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 or things are changed and that makes the offload more challenging. 
So uh, that this is the, the way that we used to work. Um, when the BPF program was attached to and the driver was informed either for the TC, NDO, or in XDP that there will be an offload, we would try to reuse the BPF infrastructure and sort of pretend that we're loading the program for the second time and uh, basically rerun the entire load uh, part of the verification and that would allow us to gather information and then and then JIT the image, uh, JIT the, the program into the hardware. But uh, as I said, uh, when we start adding more uh, advanced features, this becomes problematic. Um, and uh, the reason is, uh, as I said, uh, there is no information for which device the, the program is loaded. And, and uh, uh, a big problem is that the verifier, when the program is loaded, will actually modify it. So after the program is loaded, the original image that the user has loaded is uh, completely lost. and. Uh, we sort of have to make re reverse the modifications to, to offload it. Um, so w what we have done is right now um, we have hooked the, the driver offload stuff directly into the first invocation of the BPF program loading. Uh, when, the when users are loading the program, they, will, uh, they can optionally specify the device index, the, the net dev index for which the program will be loaded. And then the BPF system call, which find that will find that uh, net device, and uh, basically inform it about the the uh, the program as it goes through the verification and and the jitting stages. And that all will be done um, before before the modifications take place. So basically, the load uh, system call will be invoked and. Um, uh, the appropriate net net def w is found and bound to the program, and the pr the the uh, drivers then informed about the program being loaded for it. It can prepare all its uh, so its all its data structures for the translation, and then on every stage of the verification, it will get a callback with the current state, so it can learn about wi what the uh, state of of the program is as, as it is executed. And when the JIT happens, th we will not perform the JIT for the host. We will, again, just call the driver, and the driver will generate the, the, the image uh, that, that will be useful for the device, and, and th this program will not be executed on the host effectively. And uh, this also allows us to inform the, the BPF core, place some of the offload state inside the BPF program structure, which makes it easier to later report state makes it more natural to, to report state about the offload of the program without having to go through the net dev uh, infrastructure. The BPF uh, core basically already has all the information it may want to report. So um, right uh, to go again through this through the uh, challenges uh, and why we changed the, the, the model in more detail. S um, the modifications, the first item is the modifications that are performed by the verifier. Um, it changes the the, the offsets of the field offsets from the one that ones that are exposed to user space to the actual kernel uh, structure offsets, and that's slightly easy to reverse, although not entirely clear uh, clean uh, as far as the implementation goes. The second uh, problem is the functions. So when the program is loaded from user space, the functions are referred to by IDs, and after the first verification, the, the, the verifier will patch them and uh, change the instructions to contain basically pointers. Um, and the third problem is with the maps. So when the, the program is loaded, the map, load, uh, the map pointer load instructions are specially marked. Um, and that those markings are removed by the verifier. So if we want to offload the, the, device, uh, the, the program to a device, we need to uh, basically find all the map references and it's kind of impossible to, to find the pointer pointer loads when the ref the markings are already removed. Um, uh, another thing that happens uh, after the first verification is there may be a prologue or epilogue uh, generated for the program which either gener uh, populates some information or, or does some extra checking. Um, which basically again generates some code which the verifier will not be able to to parse the second time around, so that is basically a showstopper. So some features like uh, direct packet access for write would not be possible to offload in the previous uh, previous architecture, um, and there are optimizations that the verifier does, and I think today there's I think only one, 
uh, Alexi added the uh, inlining of, of lookup map uh, lookup calls. Um, uh, and again, the, the when the program is loaded from user space, the map lookup call is just a call, and I think ID ID one. But uh, the verifier will uh, inline some of the code. Is basically, the invocation uh, of the map lookup is, is sort of an I indirect call. The first helper just does basic checking and then calls the actual implementation for the given map type so that the basic checks can be inlined and then we save one uh, one the reference basically one in one call in direction and that's great for host performance but for the device it's neither useful nor nor is it possible to get that through the verifier for the second time um, um, and the, the 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 other problem is when we load the program onto the device there's really no, no flexible way to report errors and the verifier log, as much as some people may say it's deficient, it's actually quite useful and flexible to just output errors or information basically as we translate or as we verify the program. And this could be uh, just errors, like just telling the users why the program couldn't be loaded or offloaded, or just state about optimizations which were done or not done for some reason. So the verifier log is is a really useful tool but obviously if we run the the verification for the second time inside the networking subsystem there's no way for us to report it back to user space so moving the the translation for the device to to the load stage is really useful in that regard um, uh, as i said also the, the the bpfs we can now place some of the state inside the bpf program structure itself so we we are hoping to uh, report the the translated image so basically we when we translate the the program for the device we are actually generating machine code it's not like some abstract instructions that the firmware will then translate to something else it's it's the actual nfp machine code and we can take that and disassemble that with with some libraries so we are hoping to to be able to dump those images those translated images back to user space and perhaps extend bpf tool to be able to disassemble nfp code so users can see what the bpf programs were translated on the hardware to the same way they would for uh, be able to for x86 um, and that should work pretty naturally in the new uh, model the only thing we need to add is uh, the machine type effectively because if we are talking about the uh, gted image for the host it's obvious that the which disassembler to use basically the the host disassembler is is the correct one and we can easily find out what the host we are running on is but if it's an offload device and it's an nfp or an arm core or whatever else we have to include in the user space in the program information structure which which machine type the the image was generated for and another extension to which we will hopefully add soon is uh, there's a lot of places where the extended acts were added in the stack already, but the TC offloads have been left out for now, and we will hope to extend that uh, hopefully soon. We have already the X stack in XDP callback if in the XDP NDO, but uh, use the having it in the setup TC one is would be extremely useful as well. We can uh, actually we know ourselves that that this this is a very powerful tool. And the number of questions I've got asked about why my XDP program does not load fell dramatically after I implemented this. So I really like this. Um, and we'll implement this for TC as well soon. Um, another thing that, that is still uh, missing for other people for basically production readiness is being able to report um, information when the program runs on the hardware. So I think everybody who uses BPF programs today uh, uses some form of uh, print k or or the perf uh, event output to basically trace what happens to the packet as it goes through the bpf program and we uh, have the implementation of, of perf event output in the firmware but we need to bring it bring it out basically supported in the in the driver as well um and yes um as i said the optimizations uh, that we do in the in the, the driver are becoming more and more complicated and more and more complex and obviously with complexity there might some be some bugs which uh, uh, lurk in and also uh, if we start optimizing the programs in non-trivial ways we may change how the program works we don't intend to break the bpf api but obviously as we do optimizations it may things may start working slightly differently 
on the host and done on the host and until we change or fix the optimization it would be great if we had a way of like disabling particular optimizations that we have in the driver and uh, that will actually be useful for the host as well right now the the inlining optimization is, is keyed on basically jitting the program and perhaps there will be some use in being able to control that as well for a separate API instead of just like using the JIT flag. Um, and last but not least, um, I showed the, the way that we change the architecture for programs. We don't have map offload, but we are actually thinking about doing a similar thing for maps. So instead of offloading the maps when they get attached to a device, uh, create the maps from the start on the device itself. And the, the, the reasoning for that is effectively exactly the same as for the program, where there is no verifier to go through, but mm, error reporting gets a lot more easier when, when the error can be reported when the map is created instead of when the program is attached to the device. Um, and the, the complexity, there is some complexity in the process that it takes for to take a map that exists in the kernel and can be accessed through users from user space already and put it on the device. Um, we need to basically install all the map operations and offload the, 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 the map fully and then allow the operations again. It's not very hard, but it's perhaps unnecessary complexity if most people will just want to offload the map from the start. Um, and there's also some trickiness around, the, uh, around claiming the maps because we want to support the use case where there's two programs effectively reuse the same map because for instance we want to offload both of them onto the same device or replace one by the other but we can't really allow programs that are won't be offloaded to claim the same maps as those which were offloaded so there is some complexity and the maps also don't contain back pointers to the programs to which they are bound so it will simplify things if we just create the maps on the device from the start and that's basically it. Uh, we will. Are there any questions?